my pleasure to bring warm greetings from Montserrat in the Eastern Caribbean to our viewing audience on the various Facebook and YouTube channels and to our listening audience listening to Radio Montserrat. Welcome. This memorial lecture series, the Alfonso's Arrow Castle Memorial Lecture Series started in 2010. It was part of the Literary Festival. And as you know, the Literary Festival has been running from the 16th to the, is the final day of the event for 2023. The Lit Fest was started in 2009 and when Arrow died in 2010, it was an open campus decision to memorialize him with a public lecture series. It was inevitable that the overarching theme chosen for the series was the creative and cultural industries. It's a theme that facilitates multidisciplinary discussions about such things as the visual and performing arts, the media, music, literature, publishing, technology. Since 2010, we have held four symposia, six public lectures, and since COVID, since the pandemic, three online panel discussions in the series. To give you an idea of the topics that have been covered in the past, in 2010, the first symposium had as theme, creative and cultural industries, implications for developing economies. In 2011, the second symposium looked at creative industries as forces for change, innovation, and entrepreneurship. 2014, the third symposium that was held covered arts and the environment implications for the creative and cultural industries in the Caribbean. And the fourth symposium was held in 2017 with the theme, Storytelling, a Tool for National Development. Now, in terms of the lectures, we had the very first lecture in 2012, and it was done by Professor Kerwin Best from the Cave Hill campus of the University of the West Indies. And he chose us titled 10 Things Our Youth Know That We Don't About Cyberspace, Our Nation, and the Future. Then in 2013, we had the second lecture done by Dr. Sylvia Mitchell, who is a lecturer um in the plant research biotechnology center at the university of the west indies mona in jamaica and her topic was harnessing the potential of our biodiversity for health and wealth 2015 the third lecture covered thinking beyond the ash using our volcanic resources and this was done by dr aldrin sweeney who was at the time um an associate professor of medical education at ross university of medicine in Dominica, but he actually joined the UE um, Mona campus subsequently. Now, in 2016, the fourth lecture was done by Dr. Samuel Joseph, who is a, our Deputy Premier and Minister with responsibility for communications and works and ITT, ICTs and so on. And he chose as topic, ICTs transforming cultural industries. He, he is actually, he was one of the directors of Lava Bits, Montserrat's first software development company. In 2018, we had the fifth lecture in the series, and this was done by Dr. Carolyn Cooper from um, the Mona campus. Making work, capital investment in the creative and cultural industries. Then in 2019, the sixth lecture in the series was done by our Dr. Clarice Barnes. And she looked at the Chances Pond Mermaid and Diamond Snake meme, contending issues in gathering our, volcanic, our, our volcano stories, sorry. Then in 2020, we had our first online panel discussion in the lecture series. Tracing Montserrat's history through Arrow's lyrics. And on the panel, we had Edwin Martin, Herman Sargent, and Basil Chambers. Then in 2021, the second online panel discussion was entitled Preserving and Expanding Arrow's Cultural Legacy, 
and on the panel we had Andrew Skerritt, Warren Castle, and Sawandi Castle. And um, unfortunately, David Edgecombe was supposed to be on that panel as well, but um, he passed away on the same day, I think, when, when we had um, the lecture. He fell ill and, and passed, so that was a loss, quite a loss. In 2021, um, so that was in 2021 when we had the second online panel discussion. Then in 2022, we had the third online panel discussion with Dr. Rhoda Arundel, um, Ms. Anne-Marie Jewell, and Ms. Shirley Osborne um, discussing language as protest. How does preserving our dialects serve as a tool for nation building? Now tonight's distinguished lecture will be the seventh in the series and it'll be done by a two-person team. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Therese Turner-Jones, who is Director of Projects at CDB. She came highly recommended. I actually asked um, Dr. The, the President of the CDB, who we have stolen just because his wife is from Montserrat, so he belongs to us now. <laughs> I asked him, about um, having somebody from the bank assist us with the presentation for the lecture. And he recommended um, Mrs. Turner-Jones and she chose as topic stimulating economic growth in the creative industries. And we are happy to have with us Ms. Melanie Joseph, who is the CDB um, CRIF manager. And CRIF actually stands for, let me find my notes very quickly. Creative and Cultural Industries Innovation Fund. So um, I'm hoping that um, Melanie will leave us with lots of ideas as to how we can get funding for some of the projects <laughs> that we, we need to deliver. Now, um, without, let, let me introduce um, each of the presenters properly. Now that you've had a brief intro, let me do a proper job of introducing um, Mr. Turner Jones. She's a Bahamian national who currently lives in Barbados, but has also lived in Kingston, Jamaica. She did that for 10 years, which is two more than I did. I was there for eight. <laughs> Between 2013 and 2022, she worked at the Inter-American Development Bank, where she served as a general manager of the Caribbean group. Her purview spanned the IDB's operations in Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, and her home country, the Bahamas. She's correct, currently director of projects at the CDB, a position she took up after managing Max Gwen Limited, a consulting firm she founded in 2022. Now she's a trained economist with over 30 years experience in macroeconomics and economic development, and she has special expertise on the Caribbean and Latin America. She has also served the International Monetary Fund in senior posts for over 20 years, both at the staff and board level. She is considered to be a strategic thinker, a transformational leader, and a sustainability and climate change advisor. She holds a master's degree in economics from the University of East Anglia in the UK. She's also an alumnus of the U University of Toronto and United World Colleges, more specifically Leicester Pearson College. Her publications include a book on Caribbean fiscal challenges. It is an IMF, IMF publication that came out in 2014 and is entitled Caribbean Renewal, Tackling Fiscal and Debt Challenges. It was co-authored with Charles Amo Yati. I hope I pronounced his, his name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's a member of the International Women's Forum and she's passionate about financial inclusion, gender equity, children, vulnerable communities and the environment. She's an ardent champion of development issues facing small island development states, developing states, and considers climate change one of the most existential threats of our lifetime. She's a tennis fanatic. Mm -hmm. I used to love tennis, but my, the knees are not holding up anymore. <laughs> He's married to Dennis Jones, a former IMF Econ uh, economists, and they are the proud parents of three daughters, Bronwyn, Huggins, Eleanor, and Rianne Jones. I, I noticed no mention of grandchildren yet. Mm. 
<laughs> you can find her on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Now, on the platform with her is Melanie Joseph, who is coordinator of the Caribbean Development Bank's Cultural Create and Creative Industries Innovation Fund, CIF. She's a multidisciplinary creative who has been an active member of numerous performing arts groups and touring contingents for over 20 years. She's a graduate of the University of the West Indies, the St. Augustine campus, and the Center for C Cultural Policy at the University of Warwick. She has held various development and administrative roles in service of the cultural and creative industries, including literary arts, visual and performing arts and fashion, for approximately 15 years across public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Her ongoing personal research explores the organization of creativity through creative ecologies and the value of creative networks. We are happy to have her participating in this evening's lecture. I'm actually hoping that these ladies will guide me with a few projects that are placed on the back burner and which I need to implement before I retire in 2025. <laughs> <laughs> it is my pleasure to invite them to begin their presentation. Thank you so much, Grayson. It's, uh, it's really an honor to be streaming live to Montserrat at this time when you're celebrating the Literary Festival and especially following the luminaries who've gone before in terms of delivering this this lecture in honor of Alfonso Arrow Castle. Um, so Malini and I are excited to be here, especially to represent uh, the Caribbean Development Bank. And just on the point of Dr. Leon, uh, president of the bank, I must say um, right after this lecture, I'm heading to his house where we're having a mini festival probably um, trying to mimic what's happening in Montserrat right now, but um, it's a pleasure to be here. I hope that uh, what we're going to share with you tonight will be inspiring, um, suggest areas that, that CDB can help uh, promote creative industries in our region and also uh, give some real concrete lift to all of the creatives, not just in Montserrat, but around this region who are either struggling to figure out how to commercialize uh, their intellectual property and their knowledge and their ability to entertain us, uh, dress us in beautiful clothing, whether it's makeup um, or just be uh, musicians who who are we're listening to all day long um, over the airwaves. Uh, I'm hoping that especially young creatives will take away some meaningful insights from our lecture. So it's a pleasure and I'm, I, I will begin by sharing some general uh, viewpoints and Melini will come in uh, midway or one third of the way through to talk about exactly and specifically how CDB can help, what we have been doing in this area, how important it is to us that we get it right, um, and how and how we look forward to to working with all of the creatives across this region and i will then come back in at the end i want to share something from the bahamas which is our famous junk canoe which all of you i think anyone listening watching if you have an experience any bit of junk canoe you have to at least get to slide 20 uh, to hear that um, so please stay with us and, and i hope you enjoy this this what we hope will be an educational but also inspirational presentation thank you i'm going to start now so this is a really important moment in, in the life of our region because not only are countries struggling to figure out ways to diversify their economies, but we actually live in the midst of a lot of creative industries um, that span not just um, cultural practices, but also shape wealth generation um, at different levels across this region. There's a lot of economic value that can be extracted, extracted from the creative industries. And one thing is clear that we can't really separate the social value of the creative um, industries from the, from the economic value. And I think this is what, what is really fascinating about this particular topic, because we're talking about human creativity in conversation with design, resulting in the production and distribution of unique forms of knowledge, products and services. So I think this is 
a way to present this sector, this industry, this plethora of, of creative activities in a way that will demonstrate that there is economic value as well as social value to be derived from this industry. Economic growth, for example, through the creative industries requires the support of an enabling environment in which is co-created by actors across the ecosystem. And what do we mean by ecosystem? We're talking about all of the elements in the creative industry that help to support, whether it's musicians or fashion designers or YouTubers streaming content, whether it's poetry, whether it's music, whether it's a literary piece, what are the supporting elements in our economic landscape that can lend um, more support to these uh, entrepreneurs, I'm gonna call them entrepreneurs because creatives are entrepreneurs, who are actually looking to create economic value from their intellectual property. Um, and in this, we talk about uh, the, the industry from a perspective of what are the creative industries? And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. We're gonna share some data around what the creative industries are doing and how we can create wealth from the creative industries. And what are those drivers? The social dimension as well as the economic dimension. Um, and of course, uh, thinking about uh, the creative industries, what does it take for the industries to be recognized as a integral component into our economic, uh, whether it's GDP we're measuring or in economic landscape uh, in general. So, when we talk about the creative industries, exactly what do we mean? Um, I think anyone sitting listening tonight will think about how they view the creative sector. Um, our first exposure to the creative industries happened in school when we're reading poetry, we're learning how to be part of a play, um, we're making music, we learn how to play the piano, the guitar, the drums, the, the steel pan, all of that. We have people who are fashion designers, people who are designing software, animated uh, animation, making games, all of this is part of the creative industries. And so I think once you start to think about this landscape, we realize that the infinite there are infinite possibilities um, in our everyday life that we are, we are experiencing as something creative and important, um, but maybe not thinking, oh, as a young person, how, or any person, how can I actually monetize these ideas I have that are creative and how can I go about doing that in a way that makes sense? So think about these particular um, innovations that have come into our lives recently. YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Netflix, what do they have in common? Um, and all of these digital platforms are there to entertain, to educate, to bring to life content that's being created by lots of different actors. Um, I'm always fascinated by how, when we have events that happen in our countries, how quickly these particular um, platforms, digital platforms become uh, means for the dissemination, not just of social commentary, um, but how quickly the creative spirit of whether it, someone in Montserrat or the Bahamas or Trinidad or Jamaica reacting to something as, as basic as the rainfall yesterday in, in, in Jamaica, which was incredible, lots of flooding, the amount of videos that are on YouTube right now and on Instagram um, to show the, the water flowing and impassable roads. It's a way of communicating not just what we're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis, but we are actually capturing moments in time, capturing history in a way that can be entertaining, but also can be informative for the viewer, for the consumer of this information. Think about Netflix. I mean, I don't know anyone on earth who does not, ha is, does not stream Netflix uh, content. Um, and, and these providers, Netflix, Apple TV, Apple Plus, all of these, Showtime, all of these, media houses um, that are now using a digital platform to, to stream um, content, the content has to come from somewhere. And the content doesn't only have to emanate from Hollywood, but the content can come from anywhere in the world, as we are seeing. And I think 
these uh, these means of disseminating of, of creative content has a, has almost leveled the playing field in terms of how we can access and how our creatives can access the global marketplace because as we know YouTube, Netflix, TikTok, Instagram, infinite viewers, infinite members uh, around the world and this content if it's generated in the right way and if it's picked up by the right viewers and we have no idea how the content that we're sharing may be absorbed by those viewers, but we know that this is where a lot of money is currently being generated um, uh, to serve these platforms. Um, if we think about one of our most famous icons um, uh, in the Caribbean, Bob Marley, um, you know, when Bob Marley, when he started, probably had no clue um, that all these many decades later, how his his music will continue to influence. Of course, if you're Jamaican, and the first time you heard Bob Marley, you would say that, of course, it is going to be an international um, iconic figure uh, and musician. But to think if there is hardly a day that whether I'm in Jamaica, whether I'm in Washington, DC, in New York, in London, in Paris, anywhere, and if I say I live in Jamaica, or, or if I'm just driving around or listening to the radio, at one point, I'm going to hear a clip of Bob Marley's music. Um, and you know, the content was created by him. Um, his music has been packaged, repackaged, reused in so many, in so many ways. That photo there on the top right hand side, which is the entrance to the Bob Marley Muse Museum, is now an iconic um, visitors must see in, in Kingston. Um, think about the ways in which Marley, the Marley name has transcended not just the music, but has been uh, used to brand commodities, including coffee, another iconic feature of Jamaica. So there are ways in which the creative sector can take a product, whether it's music or whether it's artwork or whether it's um, film and transport us into different avenues. But I think the, the important point I'm trying to make in, in someone like Bob Marley and others who are coming after him is that starting with the creation of the music is one thing, his intellectual uh, ability to produce music that is available and absorbed and, and loved by people all over the world and how it continues to manifest itself in new iterations in different ways, um, I think is a really good example of what just one contributor in the creative industries, uh, the impact that that can have. Um, let's, let's take another iconic figure, uh, Rihanna um, from Barbados. Uh, Barbados is now synonymous with, with Rihanna. Rihanna is synonymous with Barbados. Rihanna has placed Barbados on the map, not that Barbados needed a higher placement on the map in terms of tourism, but the fact that Rihanna is uh, one of the most, uh, I think, top five female uh, income earners from music and her fashion industry speaks a lot about how one brand, Rihanna, first music, now fashion, including not just clothing, but also makeup and um, other sort of uh, areas that she's diversified her brand into can um, transform uh, an image, a brand into something iconic. Um, she has a foundation. So I think we look forward to seeing how, and Rihanna's young, we look forward to seeing how Rihanna will bloom and, and continue to grow more branches of her, of her tree um, into the future as, as her brand continues to grow. So I think the picture I have painted of the creative industries as being infinite with everyday possibilities for if you're in music, if you're in literature, if you're in drama, if you're in film, um, if you're in fashion, anything that involves intellectual property the creative mind producing something that's iconic, unique to the producer, um, the possibilities are endless. We have our models of, 
of that in from our region, from the Caribbean, which is a very small region relative to the rest of the world, um, but international iconic brands. I want to stop. I'm going to turn the presentation over now to Melanie, who's going to walk us through the work that the Caribbean Development Bank is doing in helping um, not just promote the an enabling ecosystem for creatives, but also some of the specific work we're doing to help entrepreneurs in this area. Melanie? Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, and so I'm going to take off, um, take up where um, Therese left off. And I'm going to drill down a little bit into what was just discussed. So we looked at the Bob Marley brand and the legacy. We looked at Rihanna. And I'm throwing back up this challenge or this concept of infinite everyday possibilities because we saw that one creative product or output then influenced another uh, uh, a larger brand a diversification we keep hearing that that term around um fiscal policy and and um and the state of, of of affairs in the region and the need to diversify um but the question then becomes how i want to say actually that the creative industries is organically we are built to already fulfill that closed loop cycle of production where one product or element never actually quite dies. It makes its way through and through the system. So you might record a, a piece of into um, a piece of original music for a, a, a live show. It is then picked up and it's synced into a Netflix um, one minute of a next Netflix uh, piece of content, or it may be used in a campaign for tourism, or it may be then um, the offshoot for someone's literary work it may be part of a fashion catwalk uh, presentation so again you're seeing the the loop that infinite loop where the product makes its way through and it's part of the co-creation of other products but none of this is possible without an enabling environment to provide support and when we talk about the enabling environment um, we mentioned the ecosystem earlier what does that look like? Who are those players? So at the core, at the core of all of this is a creative community because there'll be no discussion, no enabling environment to be had without the creative community at the center. Um, and, and then there are other actors and players that need to um, lean in it with support um, in response to the needs of the community. So government, academia, other related sectors, the private sector, nonprofit sector, technology has to be there because there's no way we're talking about an enabling environment and support without that. And what does that enabling environment do? What is supposed to happen? Well, policy, quality policy is supposed to come out of that um, collaboration and that, that focus, um, access to finance, bettering access to finance for creative industries, practitioners, um, and market opportunities. The ability basically to take a leap and to take um, advantage of the many market opportunities that we are outlining and that we are showing you here. What, again, some really key outputs that have to come out of an enabling environment is quality data and research. We're not just guesstimating um, the returns to GDP. We're not guesstimating the path for these products and services. Um, the policies that are coming out of these types of discussions and, and, and environments need to be robust and responsive. Um, and responsive meaning the policy really has to have legs to be able to shift and change and flex as the time um, requires. Because as you see, if we're talking about technology being paired with creative industries, technology is already five steps ahead and we are playing catch up, especially in our region. So also we have to talk about incentives and models for investment intellectual property frameworks that enable protection and enable maximizing the potential of using intellectual property for economic um, gain. Technology and e-commerce solutions, strengthening of existing infrastructure and capacity for practitioners and the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, um, and this is a very real one as well in terms of even from the banks, I would say from the CDB side, there has been learning both ways in um in 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 piloting the creative industries um fund 
because we had certain capacity and infrastructure changes to make and strengthen in order to meet the needs of the CI practitioners across the region. Um, and collaborative frameworks. There's no way that this ecosystem and this supporting enabling environment is gonna work if we are all working in silos. So everyone has to speak to each other and have the same vision and goal. So as I mentioned, CIF, the Cultural and Creative Industries Innovation Fund is a part of that ecosystem. Um, and uh, we're just one of the players and we have been able to, we are a multi-donor fund dedicated to supporting the CIs in the region, in the Caribbean region. We were established in 2017. Um, we started with a capitalization of 2.6 million US. We had a pilot cycle that completed, that was completed in March, um, 2023. And we just secured continuation approval and some replenishment. So we go until May 2027, which would be a, an updated um, cycle of the SIF. What have we done or how do we do it? We have a structure, simple structure. We um, address three core components. So I just spoke about the enabling environment. Um, we so we engage in enab enabling environment activity um, through our technical assistance, um, through finance, through collaborations. Um, we also, uh, I mentioned data driving the decisions. So we have a data intelligence stream and components of our activities. And then we have one that's dedicated to improving the competitiveness of MSMEs in the CIs for our region. We have identified priority subsectors fashion and contemporary design, the audiovisual sector, particularly film, animation, and gaming, festivals and carnivals, music, and the visual arts. And we champion a philosophy um, around learning and peer sharing. So our community of practice is also a framework where our technical assistance spreads beyond just those that get the limited grants that we may have, um, but we share resources, uh, training, knowledge products, and we encourage our grantees to also feed back into the ecosystem through this community of practice philosophy. So I'm gonna share a little bit more about how CIF has seen and supported the creative industries, projects coming out of the region that um, have generated wealth, both in a social, um, at social value and generated economic value. Because again, we mentioned you can't, it's not one or the other, it's the two. So we recently had, uh, we supported a data project and it was a training project to, to get, um, to start to build a methodology and framework that works for the region um, to update certain studies that had been begun by Dr. Vanis James. Um, in partnership with WIPO. And we were able to train 24 persons in the methodology across multiple uh, member countries of CDB. If I mentioned, didn't mention before, we serve 19 member countries in, in the region um, directly. And then indirectly through diaspora and through collaborations, we work with others. Um, so four country studies were updated at the end of this training um, and just so, some data coming out of that because we keep talking about the value and we keep talking about economic value and generating economic potential. But what exactly does that mean? So this study, these studies looked at that and they looked specifically at the contribution of the copyright um, arm of CIs to the GDPs of the countries. So, for example, in Solution, they were able to... Um, ascertain that the copyright industries are substantially more productive than the rest of the economy. This is in some recent years. Key elements of the copyright sector can actually boost the country's capacity to export. And the arts and entertainment recreation industries, they had a substantial trade surplus in 2016, which was the largest um, being seen within the copyright industries. And then in Grenada, Again, arts, entertainment, and cultural, that sector, subsector, pre created a positive trade balance. Um, and again, this shows and is pointing us, the data is pointing us in the direction that we, we are estimating um, that there's capacity to produce substantially, it's competitive, and exports and tourism are going to be impacted or continue to be impacted by these, by the CIs. Um, CIF also supported... Uh, we have supported 33 projects in our pilot cycle. This is a highlight of a few of them, but this project in Southern Belize actually really brought social and economic value in conversation, in direct conversation. In this project, over 30 women were trained from one Mayan community 
Um, it was very special as well because it was led by community. Um, they built what they thought would work. They went back to their community to, um, to communicate it in the way that they would know. And women in those communities were the scholars. They were the traditional knowledge scholars. They were the ones who knew the embroidery patterns, the significance of them, what could be used where, what colors, etc. cetera. Um, but we didn't want to just open up this arm of creative activity to commerce without having intellectual property considerations made. So intellectual property education was built in and the protection of that community's heritage elements was built in. So before anything commercial was launched, all of this took place. Um, and then they were able to launch a fashion brand. There's an e-commerce arm of operations and it has brought economic benefits to the community through employment, related tourism, um, and the list goes on. So again, this was a, a natural pairing, but a very conscious pairing of social and economic value in one CI project. We were also able to marry social concerns and economic um, wealth creation um, through our visual arts biennial project. So SIF funded and supported this project and it was a virtual um, biennial project multiple again you'd see a, a recurrent theme here um, multiple voices multiple nationalities and so 25 participating artists from around 12 countries in the caribbean region um, were part of this they looked at a very topical theme statelessness um, statelessness from a point of isolation coming from social issues environmental issues gender eco concerns marginalized voices in the community and again, the isolation and statelessness that comes from climate, climate change and disasters. And we know we are in a region that deals with this um, annually, right? So we brought these visual arts voices and practices together to deal with real social issues and see what visualizations came out of it. Um, coming out of it, there were concept prototypes. Um, on screen, you will see just one. And this one, I chose this one to showcase because it actually directly speaks to um, disaster preparedness, disaster response in a very tangible, innovative way. Um, Alana Brooks decided, um, you know, she was tired of seeing how many persons needed shelter after a hurricane, um, a large scale event, a climate event. And she thought, why not build an easy, easily assem assembly, um, an easily assembled uh, prototype and kit with instructions that is probably cheap and accessible so that families and um, communities can have these in shelters and have them at hand. And this is just one idea, but most of these ideas actually generated future business and investment potential. And, and we are looking forward to seeing what comes out of that and seeing how we can assist in the future. And finally, um, in Tobago, uh, we were able to support an animation and gaming project called Tobago Trek. And we mentioned again the intersection, just as we showed you with Rihanna and Bob Marley, there's an intersection. The CIs don't stand alone, the storytelling, the place and location. Um, so through the youth training and development um, targeted for animation and gaming, they, a team, a small team came up with Tobago Trek, Trek as a concept and developed it from story, animation, and characters coming out of the Tobago landscape. Um, of, of course, I'm saying this project intersects directly with tourism, heritage, environment, and it has, it's in its early stages, but it has potential for multiple sources of economic value. And just a few of them, for example, would be the soundtrack track for the um, project, the images, the story, the game elements, and there's an interesting um, feature in it where they are pairing some of their actual play cards with vouchers for tourism um, related experiences on island. So you see innovation here. And we can't talk about creative industries in the region without talking about creative industries and placemaking and specifically placemaking through festivals, carnivals and natural heritage. So we need to start to think about or continue to think about festivals as business place, as a business place. Festivals are also a place of ideas and cultural exchanges. 
um, I mentioned communities of practice. Communities of practice are also communities of learning, peer learning. Um, festivals are also sites of innovation. Things that we have never thought about um, show up <laughs> and then remain. Uh, festival, the festival inputs and outputs and the impact include different spheres. So it's in entertainment, tourism, culinary arts, traditional heritage, technology, beauty, fashion, and contemporary design. And that's just a handful of the areas. And um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm leaning into what Visit Montserrat says. Mm -hmm. You all have four festivals and a volcano. So what can be done with that? What can be built upon that? So for example, tried our hand at mapping that out. Multiple industries meets multiple products. You're thinking about the creation, the packaging and the distribution and what that means. Look at how many parts of the creative industries, cultural and creative industries are touched just by having a preliminary look at your Montserrat Carnival. Music, performances, design, live, live music, fashion events, arts, photography, dance, tourism, history traditional um, ways of doing things, community, right? Every time these types of festival events and place-making events happen, we are generating cohesiveness in the community. We're generating archives for community. We're generating employment. We're generating perhaps related training and education um, and digital products that last and that have their own lives on TikTok and YouTube and Instagram. Um, and so again, we kept saying infinite um, possibilities, everyday possibilities. And again, okay, four festivals, one volcano. There's lots to be there's lots to be contemplated with introducing technology into a business model or into a CI wealth generation model um, for your volcano um, as a heritage, a natural natural occurring heritage site. Um, and so, again, uh, there are lots of technological innovations happening around storytelling, around interactive experiences that are digital, that, that are remote, but also wearable technology could create a different experience um, for someone viewing um, your natural heritage sites. And again, it all comes back down to thinking about cross CI intersections, cross industry intersections, multiple industries, multiple products, infinite lifespan, actually. Um, and so I'm going to hand back over. Yes, um, Narissa, we need you to cue the most. <laughs> this is the well awaited moment. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, whenever I hear drunk country music, I almost get goosebumps because every Bahamian has that beat in their soul, and it's 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 so relatable, and it it's a it's a fabulous time. This drunk country festival for us happens on Boxing Day, December twenty sixth, and on New Year's Day, the two different parades. What you saw was just a sample of uh, of what it actually feels like and looks like, and also sounds like, but the preparation for John Canoe started early in this year where the groups, which can be up to 3,000 strong, start preparing to make their costumes, come up with a theme and present uh, when they do the rush out on Bay Street, as we call it. Um, and the competition is fierce. And then their winners announce at the end of the competition. 
but it's something every Bahamian has in their soul. Um, and so I, I am very happy to have uh, shared that with you. It's also the group that shared this video with us is also a group that's been supported by by CIF and CDB. So um, I wanted to make that make that connection. My call to action, um, of course, for Montserrat and for other persons around this region who saw this presentation tonight is really pretty straightforward. Um, think about, there are three things I'd like you to think about. And one is, you know, what, what are those unique opportunities that exist uh, for further development in your country, whether it's Montserrat or St. Kitts or Barbados, whoever's listening um, to this presentation? How will you identify and address your enabling environment gaps? So Malini went, talked a lot about what are the, what, what the ecosystem should look like to support our creative um, industry partners and producers. What are those gaps that exist in your country and how can, how can we help you overcome those? And finally, uh, you know, think about what a holistic approach to creating equitable, sustainable, economic and social wealth from your creative industries can be can be championed. So I think I'm hoping that this was exciting. I think the visuals were great. Um, I think we shared, uh, you could hear the passion from us, especially Malini, in terms of what this industry can do. Um, I'm really grateful to Graceland for inviting us to make this presentation on behalf of CDB. Um, this is very important uh, work that we're doing because so many people can be, be impacted and because our region is so creative. Um, we can do we can do anything we want, uh, but I think the world really shares in our the quality of our music, the, the, the type of uh, creatives that have gone on to the global stage. Uh, Rihanna is one and there, there are probably others um, coming up after Rihanna, our filmmakers, um, all of these people need to be celebrated. And if you are creative uh, on this live stream tonight, please reach out to Melania or myself, CDB, get in touch with Grayson. I'm sure she'd be happy to put you in touch um, and we're here to help. Thank you so much and have a good evening, everyone. You, thank you ever so much, both of you, Melanie, um, Therese, wonderful presentation. Um, I noticed that you're sort of signing off, but we need you to hold on, please don't run away. <laughs> um, Melanie mentioned something about syncing with Net Netflix, and that reminded me of what Arrow did with his music. Um, his music has been used in all kinds of ways to advertise um, computers, advertise perfume. Um, it's been used in, in um, movies, um, you name it. In fact, I was fascinated. I started collecting um, titles of movies and so on that his music had appeared in, and I was really amazed. Even um, something like um, "Who Who Who Loves um, Raymond," mm -hmm. there was an episode that had um, Arrow's music, and um, he he always referred to "Hot Hot Hot" as the cash cow, because um, I mean, it just goes on and on, you know, earning um, residuals, and um, his journey. I remember uh, attending um, one of the symposia at St. Augustine for Carifesta, and um, they were talking about um, that young chap um, who was considered a soaker. Um, Marshall. 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 Montana. 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 Marshall M Montana. Montana. And I, I sat there and thought he, he followed a path very similar to Arrow. Because Arrow left here after having won um, the Calypso competitions here, and you know he he thought it was time to let somebody else win, and he <laughs> moved on to Trinidad where he thought everything um, to do with Calypso was happening. He went to the Mecca, and um, studied on the Sparrow, mm -hmm. and um, he also said that Trinidad was a place where people met for carnival. You had um, people coming from North America looking for talent. And um, it was also a, an environment in which you could um, create your records for sale. But he said eventually pir pirating became a problem. So he st at that point, he started looking towards North America. So he had made contacts, his network would, had widened, and he started going to North America to perform. And, and from North America, he went further. So um, there was a time when he traveled with his band 
And then after a time, he said, you know, it's not cost effective. He would identify people in the different areas and employ them when he needed to perform. So he was doing interesting things like that. It was fascinating for me. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased. I, I give credit to um, Elizabeth Watson, who has written quite a bit about um, Calypsonians in Barbados. And um, I, I, I said to her one day, um, where do you get the energy to do all this? And she said, why don't you write about your cousin? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I promptly found myself home and I, I, I'm really pleased that she made a suggestion because I interviewed him and um, that's a resource that we now have. Um, it was developed into an exhibition and it's, the exhibition is being used over and over and over again um, and updated and, and so on. But I really need to update my, my um, research on him and um, get a publication out because that was one of the things that was being said at that um, symposium. that. Um, not enough people, they were actually saying that they didn't know anything about Arrow, <laughs> you know? So I, f I feel bad that I haven't um, made his name known, you know? So um, the work has to continue. Now, um, you, you mentioned that there were four publications that were updated. Are these available online? They will soon be. Oh, okay. uh, what happened is uh, they were done in our pilot cycle and we just restarted operations but we are preparing our archive of knowledge products to disseminate. Um, Nerissa, um, could we get some questions? We want to connect with, this is the discussion period and I don't want to um, monopolize the, the discussion. I'm sure there are people with lovely questions. Um, no questions coming in yet. Okay, um, well then I can carry on. Um, you talk about to, your, to your point about how our musicians travel from the region outside the region, and it always fascinates me whenever I'm traveling because I travel for work a lot, and often, many times, you know, my seatmates would be musicians, and I, you know, I'd feel kind of strange trying to ask them about where they're going and so on, but. These guys work really hard. They're on planes and they're going and they're doing shows after shows in New York and in London and coming. I mean, some guys were on my flight the other day and I think they were going, if I'm not mistaken, they were heading to Russia. I was surprised. <laughs> um, but our musicians are traveling around the world to to make money. Um, and, and this is the life of, of an international museum, um, musician. Um, but this point that Arrow was making that, look, that's that's also costly. And using the digital platforms that are available today, whether it's streaming the music or having a gig on, you know, having your music up on YouTube or the way we, uh, you know, the way that music can now be commoditized in different ways to reach the rest of the world. That's the next frontier, right, for our artists. Um, and not just, not just musicians, but even our visual artists, there are ways to do it. I have a 20 year old who is studying film in university in California. And one of her gigs right now is she's done a lot of, she loves photography. She's done a lot of photographs of uh, Jamaica because we lived there for 10 years and, and she's really, well, she actually has Jamaican citizenship now because her father's Jamaican. But she has done a series of photographs that she has now posted on a site where she is selling these prints um, under her name. So um, there are all kinds of ways that I think that young people can make money in the creative sector. And the, the beauty of technology today is that you can really do it. You can do it, one, with your iPhone. Lots of things you can do with your iPhone, including make movies, because the quality of the photography you can get on an iPhone now and the kinds of movies you can make on iPhone, pretty incredible. And that's why the TikTok uh, phenomena. Um, but they're just so, I think, access to the rest of the world and markets because of technology is really a huge advantage for our region because we're small, our markets are small. So, you know, Montserrat, think of Montserrat, right? Yeah, I'm Everybody in Montserrat probably has at least several of, of Arrow songs but you need, the, the market is bigger than, than Montserrat for him, right? It's the whole world. And how do you get that out, out there? So I think this is, this is where our, our entrepreneurs need to pitch their, 
their products. It's not, our market is too small. Yes, you can make some money, but really, if you want to really extract optimal economic value, what we're saying is let's help you reach those external markets and, and broaden your horizons there. Yeah. Then I'm the seeing... more questions coming in. Um, okay, yes, I'm seeing... I, you're seeing it? Okay. Yes, I'm seeing quite a few of the questions. And um, so I'm going to start by tapping into what, what you all were talking about and reminding us too that CI practitioners and the space tend to be innovators. You see those models that Arrow was testing and piloting mm -hmm. on his own, you know, and realizing when it was time to leave that curve and do something else um, and even generating employment in a, in, a, in a way that was just working with his um, limitations. That's something we need to think about. That's something we saw that one of the challenges we had with the CIF pilot was as it was being implemented, the global pandemic. And if, and a lot of those projects had to rescope and reshape, but they still found a way to deliver. And they were the first out of the gate testing certain technology. Um, and now there are models to be repeated, you know? Um, so that's something to think about. Um, and I'm gonna tap into the question about AI coming oh, out. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll get back to this issue. <laughs> yeah, so that question about how can artists benefit and grow in a world with AI, which is taking over so much of the creative space. I want us to think back to, I know in Trinidad, there was a, 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 a period of time where local versus foreign content, that was a huge um, watershed type of moment, the radio stations and the media. And it became a conversation about quotas. And I, we, there's no way around AI. AI is here and AI has benefits. What we need is a supporting, enabling environment to ensure that there's education and awareness, there's protection, there are the legal frameworks, the policies, so that the creative industries engages with AI in a way that's beneficial in both ways. And we are not left on the, on the back foot. Um, and so human input quotas, have to be talked about. There's no way we just spoke about social and, and, and economic wealth and generation. So I hope that answers that question. We, but we can't not interface with AI and we can't not start to talk about it and start to debate how it's going to be dealt with. It's already here. Mm -hmm. um, this is a good question. Many creatives aren't registered as a business. Mm -hmm. What is the reason for this? And I think th this is really the crux of it, right? Because creatives see themselves as creatives and they're not necessarily thinking about the business underpinnings of, of being a business and that, that, that their brand, their product is, is something worth protecting. So intellectual property, and we can't stress this enough. You have to find a way to protect your inter intellectual property because it will get stolen. And speaking of AI, this is exactly what happens, right? Okay. And once that happens, you have no protection, you have no patents, you have no anything, you haven't registered. Um, it becomes really difficult to then get it back. Once it's out the gate, once somebody else can use it, uh, it's complicated. So talk to us, <laughs> we can advise on those issues. Um, but I think part of the reason is creatives don't necessarily see themselves as, as business as folks. So it's a mindset that we have to change also. Um, when we start talking about creatives as creating value, creating economic activity, creating jobs for others, then I think they start to see it, they start to see it differently. Obviously, it also happens when they start to be successful and they realize, oh, I'm growing, I'm making money and, and there's a lot to this. Um, but I think the initial instinct is not to say, oh, I'm a business person because somehow business and creativity doesn't go together. But no, they, they do go together, especially today. I mean, and, you know, just think about think about Hollywood, think about Silicon Valley, think about all the content that's being generated now because of technology and, and the internet and how that has, it's been an explosion of new industries as a result. Um, and, and creatives, you know, it, it's not, it could be that you, perhaps you're a, a graphic artist how can you use those skills to help other industries like the health industry that is morphing into telemedicine, for example? Education. We need, yeah, an education. How do we break down subjects in a way that our children can 
acquire math skills, for example, easier if there's more visualization of it and more examples. So I think infinite, <laughs> infinite yeah. possibilities. But right? it, it goes two ways. Um, it goes two ways. So it's about creatives sometimes not recognizing that it's a business or there's business potential. Um, but also it, it's, it's about recognizing if that's the way that you want to operate as well. And I think that's why we talk about ecosystem. There's room for all of the different actors and players, but you need to understand, define your role, your work, your vision, your goal. Um, sometimes you may be for profit and sometimes you're not. Maybe it's seasonal, right? Um, but also then in languaging and placing yourself in, in business terms and, and, and leaning on people who can, who know, have the know-how. So that's also something. You don't have to do it all on your own. Um, there are professional services and, 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 and specialists in those areas, right? And um, we actually, that's a question in the mm -hmm. chat, does CIF support um, creators and business owners to register IP? We don't directly do it, but we can. Um, we have a consultant database. Um, we do regular like training and um, engagement, stakeholder engagement forums where you can get introductions into this and point it into the right direction, um, depending on the region that you're in, the, the subsector that you're in. Um, but again, if, if the conversation in terms of formalizing your operations doesn't happen in the creative core, then when you go to the business and finance core, um, they don't have the room <laughs> to engage with us in the way that we want. And so then you are faced with disappointment and, you know, you've been told that you can't qualify for certain things. C CIF and CDB is doing work in that sphere as well in terms of um, beginning to educate financial institutions on how the creative industry business is formed and looks and works, what a balance sheet in a creative industry business might look like mm -hmm. and why it's a little different from traditional business, why intellectual property assets need to be considered as collateral uh, for credits and loans. We're getting there. We're slowly, we're starting by educating and having the difficult conversations and challenging the institutions as well to respond in a like way, but it has to happen on all sides. So we can't ask for creative industry businesses to be given access to finance if they aren't starting to function and um, you know structure themselves in a way that will help. Yeah. Yeah. There's another question. How can creatives get into your data? Okay, so I'm gonna leave the um, you can email us at CIIF at caribank.org. We are also we also have a web page on the Caribbean, Caribbean Development Bank's website. And there you can learn a little more about what we've done, what we do, and when we plan on opening funding opportunities. I saw that question higher up. Um, so we're in planning and design stage, and it's really important for us to get it right, get what we didn't get right last um, cycle. Um, and again, it is in response to feedback from those who benefited, those who did not benefit the last time, um, and evaluation practices. So we're looking really carefully at how we design our grant calls, what size they are, what other supporting mechanisms um, grant awardees need to make it through this, um, this journey with us. Um, and while we do that, while we do have limited grants and resources, we continue with our community of practice, our stakeholder engagement, and any opportunities that our partners have, we pass along to you through the database registration. So just sign up. Get in touch with us, and we will make sure that you know what's happening um, 2024 onward. Did I miss any other question? Is it for individuals or business organizations? So we are geared towards serving MSMEs, micro, small, and medium enterprises. But we have a re we have a regulation that you need to be registered in some way. Um, so we do do sole um, sole proprietor engagement, but also small business um, registrations. We deal with acad um, academic organizations, business support organizations. We deal with uh, collaborative enterprises as well. So you can come if you aren't registered, but you may be the driving creative directive force, but you have a partner who you work with regularly. Um, you all have a, a working agreement. They may be the registered business that qualifies to apply for SIF funding. So you, there, there are many ways to think about approaching um, us. And we design our calls around the subsectors and the sub themes that I shared. Um, and so there are schedule of calls along the time. 
and it's open to all of our foreign member countries, all of our 19 um, member countries of the bank. <laughs> um, and those opportunities also multiply. So you may not get a grant, but you may be able to participate in training that comes out of a grant um, funded project. And then there are prize grants and other supporting mechanisms. There, there are two things that I'd like to say. Um, the link, um, uh, Nerissa, can you put up the link again? Um, Arrow King of Soka. Yeah, um, I'd like to thank Sawandi, who is um, Arrow's son, who provided that link. He says that um, all of the digital assets can be found at that link. All of Arrow's digital assets can be found at that link. And um, they're working on, okay. on um, various things for the future. So um, there's some hope uh, something different will be appearing in the near future. Now, um, Melanie, you mentioned that um, the, the importance of support for the industry. And I'd like to tell this story. Um, it's a true story of a friend who's an artist, um, Haitian, and he was doing well. There was a German man who was interested in his work. And he said, OK, I'm going to put you in a room got an, an apartment for him and his wife and said, all you do is paint. You, you're going to do what you do well. And he dealt with the marketing and um, the networking, um, sourcing of um, the inputs and so on. The wife worked in a bank and she saw him, the German, um, <laughs> making large deposits. <laughs> and said to the husband, um, look, I think he's ripping you off. You you better control that part of the business as well. So while he was trying to control that part of the business, he couldn't paint. Mm -hmm. He didn't have access to the kind of um, markets that the German did. He, mm -hmm. you, you, saw, you, you, you actually could see the change in the product yeah. because the frames for the, his work started looking totally different. And eventually, um, things got really bad. Divorce came, <laughs> you know. So there's, there's a story um, that highlights the importance of recognizing that creatives sometimes need the administrative support. And I'm always saying that um, the enabling environment that we need to create for um, creatives would be one where we, we deal with the mundane things like accounting and so on and Absolutely. tell them when they have to renew licenses and all of that mm -hmm. and just leave them to do the, the creative stuff. And um, it was something that I thought like our chambers of commerce, um, the business organizations and so on could put that, that kind of service for, for the, the, the community. Yes. So it's something that I, I would like to see happen because I think it's necessary because um, creatives, artists, um, and not very practical for the most part. That's why they're artists, mm -hmm. you know. So they always need to have a champion kind of um, doing the other things for them. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. And we saw it. We saw it with. We saw it in real time with some of the grants. Um, too much was being too much was being asked of the creative, but it's grant funding. So there's reporting and there's a structure for it. So with that understanding. Um, I'm preloading that as people ask about the fund and that they ask about how they can benefit, think about the way in which you're going to approach us and what is going to come. Um, grant funding has specific responsibilities and administrative needs um, that you may need to think of out, um, outsourcing and budget for outsourcing. Yeah, that's a, this is a really important point. It's linked to the one above, right? Like why they're not registered. They're not registered because that's not how their brain works. Um, uh, and, and I agree, we're asking too much and sometimes, and this is where banks fall down too, right? Mm -hmm. So even not just in the creative sector, but small business, small business owners who are, they want to run a business or they know how to do something, but they're not quite there on all of the fiduciary requirements mm -hmm. that a bank may be asking. So yeah. all of that is what we call the ecosystem for for thriving in, in this sector um, that that all countries need to work on um, to be able to support our creatives throughout, throughout the region, throughout the region. So, yeah, 
and technology very helps. Technology helps. Technology is helping in a big way. There are apps that help um, organize your paperwork or prompt you to do certain things. Um, so AI, yes, AI can help with within reason. <laughs> in that sense, yes, correct. We we have a couple of um, course outlines for um, how IP can be used um, for creating uh, wealth. Um, your trademarks and so on, how you can use them. Mm -hmm. And um, and then there's a short w workshop, you know, to protect people who want to go into the social um, media arena and um, who may end up being sued, just like um, Cardi B um, is waiting to be paid. Uh, for, um, there's a social media influencer mm -hmm. who started saying things about her that she challenged. And um, she, she, uh, the person is expected to pay several million do US dollars. And she's saying that she's going to plead bankruptcy because she's unable to pay. But basically, um, it's this thing of you can't go into the so social media sphere and say whatever you like. You have, you have to think about. So um, we, we have these workshops planned for next year. Um, so hopefully, that will be an education. Um, opportunity yeah. for that's really important i also wanted to add that you know part of cdb's remit also is to make sure more women have access to economic opportunities and this is a really good um area where women because i think women face many more challenges than men when they're accessing finance if they want to run a business but this is one of those sectors where and I was listening to the people who have given this lecture before, and if I'm not mistaken, I think the majority of them are women so far. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly, we have some, we have a big interest in 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 making sure that the the playing field, especially for women-owned businesses, women creatives, um, we can advance that in this region because, of course, the more women are economically empowered, then we know that our children will be safe, they'll be looked Correct. after, and the communities will be will be thriving. Uh, so I, I, I send a, a special message out to the women listening that um, if you're in this space, um, make sure that you approaching your intellectual property in a prudent manner. If you need advice, find the advice. Uh, let's not be exploited. Um, uh, but there, there are ways to get you special help. We now have a tweet. She trades. She trades, she trades platform. It's always hard to say, uh, which is specifically focused on women-owned businesses and trying to get them to access export markets. So we'll also post that um, that link in the in the chat. Have you have you identified a solution for um, for people in these small islands for being able to collect money online? Because that's that's a, a, a barrier for um, some of our people who want to do business online, that they... I've heard that. I've heard that. Um, they talk too many hoops. Uh, to, and not, to only, um, not only in the smaller islands. In uh, Trinidad, it's, yeah, the banking systems are... Not international, not integrated or something. I don't know. Yeah, I, I can so give you respond. a concrete <laughs> example. The Bahamas, we have a jeweler who produce, I don't remember, not that this is very significant, but Princess Kate came to the Bahamas and the jewelry she wore um, were designed, the, was, the jewelry was designed by a Bahamian, a young Bahamian artist, a uh, jeweler, who actually makes her jewelry in Turkey. Okay. And wow. she got, her website got overheated mm -hmm. on demand for, for these earrings and the jewelry um, and she faces exactly problem. She couldn't get her online payment system to work quickly enough to satisfy the orders as they were coming in. And it cost her thousands of dollars in sales. So really important point you're just making. I don't really know what the answer to that is, but we have to figure it out. We, yeah, we're going to continue to figure it out mm -hmm. because I know in the private sector division, they're looking again at what access to finance means both ways mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. because digital banking and and that type of trade a lot of um creative products are exported or bought digitally 
Yes. Online yeah. um, e-commerce, yeah. And how does that money actually So I'm adding to that recipient? to the list of things too. Thank really. you for raising that, Grace, and that's a really important point. Yeah. Um, yeah. That is part of the enabling environment Absolutely. conversation. Yeah. Um, finance institutions, governments, because a lot of it is tied, tied to um, policy. Yeah. But, and you mentioned, yeah, just a small island. I don't think, obviously, it's not it's a small possible. island issue. My daughter, I just mentioned in LA, it reminded me that she said, Mommy, oh, something's happening with the link, and somehow they can't make the payment. But now I fixed it. So, um, so it happens everywhere. It happens everywhere. Um, Narissa, are you seeing anything from YouTube, Facebook that I need to bring to the table? Okay, well, okay. this has been a wonderful discussion. This has been a wonderful discussion. And I'd like to thank, um, first of all, Dr. Hygienist Jean Leon, who recommended um, his staff from, from the CDB. This has been a wonderful um, uh, learning experience for all of us. Um, and when you meet up with him later, please take our love to both will. himself and to Brenda. Absolutely. And um, I'd like to say a special thanks to Nerissa, who has been working hard all day, but who has um, facilitated this evening's presentation. And Nerissa, thank you ever so much. Um, Nerissa is responsible for the delivery of the literary festival and has been doing that since um, 2020 and doing a really good job. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm so relieved that I no longer have that burden. <laughs> It, it was a labor of love, but um, it's nice to have to be able to pass it on to the younger people who have better ideas, who are more energetic, and um, and, and and new skills. You know, she's incorporated all of her um, skills into the delivery of the literary festival, and her network as well. I'd like to thank Radio Montserrat. Radio Montserrat has been very helpful in terms of promoting the lecture. And um, I was promised it would be carried live. And I imagine that um, we have more listeners than we have viewers because um, not everyone wants to be clicking. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I'd like to also thank the viewing audience wherever um, our, our Montrachians are or other people are listening in. Thank you for um, being here this evening. And not at all least, the presenters fantastic job Thank you. and um of course you, you you mentioned goosebumps when you um brought on the john canoe i was here dancing fortunately <laughs> fortunately the um the camera was off me <laughs> no but that's what it does it, it's just an electrifying experience and if you've I, never I, been to john canoe gotta come at least one year ex exactly I, I thought i have to go and and, and experience that live yeah, and um, it also reminded me of our masquerade, which is something that I'd like to market because I, I think um, cultural studies, um, you know, it's, it's something. Each um, island has its own masquerade tra um, tradition, and mm -hmm. and we can do so much with that in the region, and and we have our partners in Guadeloupe. You know, they've come across several times to join in our festivals, mm -hmm. and um, they're willing to come and be part of a, a cultural studies program as well. So. Um, with that, let me thank both of you. Maylene, we'll be in touch. I imagine that you'll be flooded with requests. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but we'll, um, we'll get to each and every one of them. <laughs> and I, I promise to, to, to assist in, in terms of um, being, being the go-between um, okay, for those great. of you who didn't capture the information that was on the screen. And of course, the people who are listening wouldn't have had that opportunity. So um, don't be afraid to get in touch with Montserrat at Open. Or oh, if you see me on the road, just tell me. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what happened most of the time people um approach me and say you know um we need to do so and so i'm interested in learning so and so and that's how we um sometimes put on programs because people indicate an interest and um we follow up with with um the delivery of a program that meets their needs so without further ado um Nerissa, have i forgotten anybody in terms of who i should be thanking And I, I don't want to hold up. Um, yes, I need, to get, I need to get out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> really good. Thank yeah. you so much for having us. This has been a very valuable um, 
evening for me and um i imagine it's the same for the people who are listening thank you so much for sharing your knowledge yeah. and your expertise oh i'm mailing i need you to help me with my um virtual choir okay all right <laughs> Got it. <laughs> You're most welcome. I'll be there. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, everyone. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night. Good evening.